Hello again. So this lecture is covering chapter 27, hematological and lymphatic uh, system assessment function and therapeutic measures. So let's get started. So we're going to talk about the hematological system and the lymphatic system because they do work together hand in hand. We're going to talk about blood, blood components, lymphatic system and their components. We're going to understand what kind of data we have to collect when we're taking care of these kinds of patients, laboratory results and diagnostics that we're looking at when we're evaluating these systems, and most of all, as always, what's your job as the nurse? So how we're going to plan nursing care in caring for patients with disorders in these systems, uh, therapeutic measures that are used, and what the role is of the nurse when we're talking about the administration of blood. Okay. All right. So let's start with just looking at each system. The hematological system is bone marrow, right? And your blood and blood components. So when we talk about bone marrow, remember way back when in body structure and function, your bone marrow is where all of your blood cells are made. Red blood cells, which become their erythrocytes that become hemoglobin when they grab a hold of the heme, the iron. White blood cells, they're the ones that fight infection, part of your immune system. And then platelets, also known as thrombocytes, and they are the cells that take part in a big process that enables your body's blood to clot and prevent you from bleeding. And so we're looking at blood and blood components. And then we're going to look at the lymphatic system, which consists of lymph nodes, lymph nodules, lymph or lymphatic vessels, which are kind of similar to blood vessels. Okay, that carry the lymph. So start with blood. When we go to a lab and they draw blood, you look at a tube of blood, there are lots of things going on in there. You've got plasma and your white blood cells and your red blood cells and your platelets. Okay, And what are they for? The main job of hemoglobin, which are your red blood cells, hemoglobin, is to carry oxygen to all your cells, your tissues, your organs, your brain and pick up carbon dioxide, which is the waste, and transport that back to the heart so it can get pumped into the lungs and we get rid of it through respirations, right? So transport, transporting oxygen, transporting carbon dioxide. Your blood, believe it or not, also helps to regulate and maintain your body temperature, right? And just fun fact, normal, and we hate the word normal, but a normal body temperature is 98.6 you will find that there are lots of variables. Older people tend to run lower um, just because they don't move as much, right? So, you know, but blood plays a vital role in maintaining that body temperature. And then transporting cells that offer protection. Well, that's your white blood cells too. So your white blood cells, and there are five types, protect us, but in different ways, okay? And we're going to talk about that a little bit more as well. So, when you look at slide seven, you're looking at the actual tube of blood after it has been spun down. So in other words, when you go to the lab and they draw your blood, at first it just, it's a nice red tube of blood. And they put it in a machine that's called a centrifuge. And the machine spins it down. It spins really, really fast. And when it does that, it separates the plasma from the components of the blood. And that picture is a really good representation of what it looks like. So what you see at the top floating is the plasma, kind of looks a little yellowish, and it's the liquid that the blood components travel in. So that's plasma. At the bottom, mostly red, you see that it's nice and red, and that's your red blood cells. And then in the middle of the tube, there's a thin little band that's represented as a white band. That little itty-bitty percentage are your white blood cells and your platelets, because those are things that your body makes on demand. So in other words, if there's something going on, like an infectious process that's starting, your white blood cell count is going to increase. So you're going to see more white blood cells. That band would get larger, right? If everything is copacetic and you're not having any problems, that band is, is small, like it's represented in that picture. Diagram eight goes into which types of cells um, start out as what and then become red blood cells, become the different types of white blood cells, A granulocytes or granulocytes, and then which ones become platelets. You don't really need to know that, but definitely you can take a look at it and kind of for review. 
Um, slide number nine is basically, it's a breakdown of red blood cells, right? So you have macrophages. Whenever I think of macrophages, I think of Pac-Man. And I know that sounds kind of funny. Maybe some of you are too young to really remember that. Um, but macrophages are the um, part of the immune response. They're Pac-Man. They eat up pathogens. In this case, they eat up old red blood cells. A red blood cell lives about 120 days and it gets old and worn out just like people do. So in the liver and the spleen, these macrophages they gobble up the old red blood cells. And then the hemoglobin gets break down. You've got the globin and the heme. So the heme is the iron and, and part of it is bilirubin, believe it or not, which that part of it is broken down even further. You've got the heme and the bilirubin, and the heme is actually transported to the bone marrow where it plays a role in making more new red blood cells. The bilirubin is what the liver takes and sends into your intestines to get excreted, goes in with the bile kind of, and goes out with the feces because you don't need that. That's like the waste product. And then the globin part is think of it as a protein. So it's broken down into amino acids and the amino acids are either used to create energy or they can form together to create a whole new plasma protein, part of albumin, okay? Um, slide 10 goes into formation of a blood clot. You don't really need to know every single part of the process, but you do need to understand that in order for blood to clot, there are lots of things that are taking place and lots of, of variables in the equation. Platelets are one thing that are necessary. Fibrinogen, thrombin, plate, um, clotting factors in the blood. And so all of those things have to work just really symbiotically together to say, uh-oh, she's bleeding, make a clot, make it stop. And that's how blood clots, okay? Um, the lymphatic system, what do you need to know about that? Well, you've got lymph. When I say lymph or when you read the word lymph, they're talking about lymphatic fluid. You've got lymph nodes, lymph nodules, lymph vessels. And then you have two accessory organs um, to the lymphatic system, which are your spleen and your thymus. And the whole purpose of the lymphatic system is making sure that your blood volume and fluid volume is balanced, right? And also protection part of your immune response, protect, protecting your body from pathogens and foreign materials that possibly could get in. Slide 12 has a really great diagram um, looking at the lymphatic system and the organs involved. Uh, just a couple of things to kind of jog your memory from body structure and function. In the chest, you'll see the thymus gland. The way to remember it is T cells are trained in the thymus, TTT. T cells are trained in the thymus. So when you're a child, your thymus gland is actually quite large because that is where T lymphocytes, a particular type of white blood cell, go to mature. And while they're there in the thymus, they're actually being trained. They're, they're learning what is yours, things they should not attack, and then what are things that are foreign that they should attack. That's how they protect you. They're kind of like soldiers. And with autoimmune diseases, one of the things that there's a hypothesis about is that somehow something goes wrong genetically within the thymus gland when they're being trained and they can't differentiate what belongs to you and what's a pathogen, which is why with autoimmune disorders, your immune system attacks your own stuff, organs, skin, tissue, et cetera. Okay. Um, when you look at that diagram, you'll see the lymphatic vessels and everywhere that there's blood, there's lymph. So you have those lymphatic vessels that, you know, branch off all through your body. Then you have nodes, nodules, um, and some of them are, are more clustered together in some parts than in other parts. The cervical lymph nodes are kind of back here, like the, the back part of the neck. And if you palpate them, you may or may not be able to feel them. They kind of feel like little peas 
underneath the skin. And lymph nodes can swell for different reasons. Um, If you have any type of an infection, lymph nodes are swelling. And that's not a bad thing. That just means that they're doing their job, right? That's what they're doing. They're, they're, They're enlarged because they're fighting off infection, maybe gathering those pathogens out of your body so they can get rid of them. But then there are certain types of cancers, like lymphatic cancers, lymphoma, for example, where the patient will present with painless cervical lymph adenopathy. So no pain when they're touched, they're not tender, but the cervical lymph nodes, lymph adenopathy means that they are enlarged. And that is actually one of the warning signs of certain types of lymphoma. So, but we'll talk about cancer down the road. And then you see your spleen. Your spleen's kind of like a holding area. It helps with the destruction of red blood cells like we talked about already. Um, And it also can store some blood cells in the event that there's an emergency and and your body needs them. You can live without your spleen, but it's better if you keep it. And then you can see there are other lymph nodes in clusters, particularly at the axillae, so underneath the arms, and then at the inguinal areas in the groin. And those are other um, lymphatic nodules or nodes that you can actually touch, palpate, okay? Um, With aging, things that change within the hematological and lymphatic system, just like everything else, um, the body parts are basically getting old and they're starting to wear out. So you're going to see a decreased immune response with the elderly. Things are slower to get started. Uh, which puts older people at more of a risk for infection. Uh, You're going to see the production of cells, white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets slow down. It's not as snappy as it used to be when people were young. So these are things to take into consideration when you're assessing people. Their age really does have um, a big role in, you know, their state of health. When you're taking a health history, and I'm looking at slide 14, you know, always what's the chief complaint? Why are you here? Why are you seeking care? You're always going to look at family history because so many of these disease processes are familial. They're genetic. They run in families. You're going to ask about diet because you are what you eat. I say that all the time and it really is true. What medications are you taking? And make sure that when you ask that question, you're being super specific, not just prescription meds. Are you taking over-the-counter pain relief? any kinds of herbals, vitamins, supplements, anything. We need all that information. It's critical. What do you do for a living? Or if you're retired, what did you do for a living? Because your occupation can expose you to certain chemicals, pathogens, and that would be important in your health state. Do you feel tired? It could be a sign of anemia. Bleeding. Do you find that if you get a cut that you tend to bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed and, you know, difficult to stop the bleeding? Do you have any respiratory symptoms like shortness of breath? Do you have any changes in your skin um, that your skin is really uh, paints a picture of your state of health? So things like, for example, petechiae. Petechiae are those little kind of red pinpoint dots, and they can be a sign of bleeding. And then there's purpura. Purpura, just like it sounds like the word purple, they're, they're like splotches, purple splotches, and they are an indicator of bleeding as well. And then I talked about this already, but lymph adenopathy. So if there are swollen lymph nodes, that's kind of could be a warning sign. When you do your physical assessment, your objective assessment, what are their vital signs? What's their level of consciousness? What's their skin color? Is it normal for their ethnicity or are they very pale? Um, are, is there petechiae, ecchymosis that's noticeable? What do the lymph nodes feel like? Are they palpable? What do their fingernails look like? Because fingernails tell a story too. You know, fingernails that have ridges in them um, or that are uh, hardened or tips of the fingers that appear clubbed. Those are all, you know, signs and symptoms of different underlying medical conditions that are important to note. When we're testing to try to figure out if something is wrong with a patient, with regard to their hematological or lymphatic system, there are lots of tests that we can do. There are blood tests, coagulation tests, biopsies. So when we talk about blood tests, typically we're looking at a CBC. What is the number of red blood cells? It's the hemoglobin, white blood cells, platelets, and then hematocrit. 
hematocrit is, it talks about hemoconcentration. So it's the blood equivalent to a urine analysis specific gravity. Hematocrit's represented as a percentage, and it's really speaking to how thick or how thin is the person's blood. Okay? Coagulation tests, PT, prothrombin time, PTT, partial thromboplastin time, vitamin K, because we know that fat-soluble vitamin plays a big role in clotting, um, bone marrow biopsy. So diseases, for example, like leukemia, which is a basically a cancer of the blood, and there are different types, and we'll talk about those later, um, can be definitively diagnosed by obtaining a biopsy of the patient's bone marrow. Um, I would read the care plan about bone marrow biopsy. That's in your textbook. Um, lymph angiography. Whenever you see angiography or angiogram, just remember it is about using contrast dye and radiographic waves, x-ray waves, right, to visualize the flow of either blood through the arteries or lymph through the lymphatic vessels. Here, lymph angiography, it's pertaining to the lymphatic vessels. And then lymph node biopsy, um, one of the other common things with breast cancers. Uh, because of the proximity of the breast to the axillary lymphatic nodes, you know, you will often see lymph involvement. So if a woman or even a man, because men can get breast cancer, is diagnosed with breast cancer, has it spread or metastasized into the lymphatic nodes? So at that point, a lymph node biopsy would be warranted uh, just to see, because once there's metastasis, especially into the lymph system, just if you just look at that picture of that woman that shows you the lymph vessels, it's carrying all through the body. And uh, the spread or metastasis can be even faster, unfortunately. When we talk about blood products, receiving blood products, you know, there are lots of things, but the three things I really want you to understand, packed red blood cells. So when somebody said they had to give me blood, it's usually what they're talking about. Get them a unit of packed RBCs, packed red blood cells, platelets because of some kind of coagulation problem or albumin. And albumin, again, is a plasma protein. Different reasons for, uh, you know, somebody receiving that. But what I want to talk to you about right now is transfusion, blood transfusion, and transfusion safety. So, and I went into a lot of detail in these next few slides. Transfusion safety, you have to do a thorough assessment of your patient. Allergies, you know, past history, family history, etc. Um, you always need to make sure that you've got the right blood, and we're going to talk about blood compatibility in a minute. The only thing that is compatible with blood or blood products is normal saline, 0.9% sodium chloride, that's it, and filtered tubing. So uh, on slide 19, what I've done is I've pulled uh, some information from the Merck manual. So it tells you the steps, you know, before you start a transfusion, there's got to be informed consent. The patient has to be absolutely identified, their wristband, the unit label on the blood bag, the compatibility test, which by the way is called a um, type and cross. So we get their blood type and we cross match it. It's checked when you get the blood at the blood bank and it's checked again at the bedside to make sure that you're giving the right patient that blood. Uh, as far as an IV, 18 gauge really or larger, 16 gauge is what we always used. Uh, and the, for the size of the needle for the angiocath or the IV, because if the gauge of the needle is too narrow, what can happen is the blood cells as they're going in can actually break apart and that's hemolysis. So mechanical damage means that when they're going through, they're kind of <laughs> going through an opening that's too tight, and it damages the blood cells. Uh, you always use a standard filter, only 0.9% saline, right? like I talked about earlier. You can't use any hypotonic solutions, like um, uh, you know uh, anything other than normal saline, because it can actually either destroy or lyse the red blood cells, and then lactated ringers 
has some calcium in it, which can actually make the blood clot pretty quick. Blood has to be administered as quickly as possible once it's gotten from the blood bank. Can't let it sit. And blood, if you're giving one unit of any kind of blood or blood component, four hours or less. The longer it takes for the blood to infuse, the higher the risk of some type of bacterial growth and infection uh, for the patient. And if we have to slow down the infusion, which a lot of times we have to do this because the patient has congestive heart failure, they're prone to fluid retention, hypervolemia, we can break down the units before we get them from the blood bank. So in other words, one unit of packed red blood cells may have to be divided into two so we can give them over a longer stretch of time. And then also one of the things that you may see is an order for, say, furosemide between units to try to help get the excess volume out of the patient while still being able to give them the blood that they so desperately need. So uh, risk associated with any kind of blood transfusion. I've listed the different types of reactions. Patient can have a febrile reaction, which is a fever a urticarial reaction, hives, hemolytic reaction, and usually that's because of blood type incompatibility. Patients getting an incompatible type of blood. A hemolytic reaction is pretty quick, and it's a breakdown or hemolysis of the red blood cells. Anaphylaxis, of course, which is an allergic reaction, and then, you know, circulatory overload, hypervolemia. When we talk about blood types, you have four types of blood. And the next one is a little chart that shows you. You have A, B, A, B, and O. Okay. And so the way it works is A has the A antigens and B antibodies, right? B has B antigens and A antibodies. You don't need to know all that. You just need to understand this, that if you have blood type A, B, A, B, has no antibodies to anything. So AB is the universal recipient. They can get A, they can get B, they can get AB, or they can get O, right? That's the beauty of people that have AB blood. If you have O blood, O is considered the universal donor. O has no antigens for anything. And so O can be given to, if you have AB, A, B or O. They're the universal donor. And really it's O negative. And I'm going to explain the rhesus factor, which is the RH factor. That's when we say your blood is negative or positive. And it's really not that hard to understand. So you either have positive or negative blood. Positive means that you have the antigen. You have the RH, the rhesus factor in your blood. Negative means that you don't. And that's a big factor when we talk about compatibility. Understand, if you have positive blood, you can get positive blood or negative blood. But if you have negative blood, you can only get negative blood because I can't give you something that you don't already have. It will trigger a reaction. Okay? So I'm A negative. I could receive A negative blood or I could receive O negative blood. That's it. Okay? So people that are positive, whether it's A positive, B positive, AB positive, O positive, they can get positive blood or negative blood. But anybody that's negative cannot receive positive blood. All right? So now that you're sufficiently confused. Uh, the next slide has an actual photograph of a, you know, blood hanging. And what you see is you see the blood is on one side in a bag, and then the other side is a bag of normal saline. And it's attached to Y tubing. The tubing actually is like a Y, right? So one tube from the blood, one tube from the saline. They meet, they converge into one solitary tube that goes through the infusion pump and then gets connected to the patient. When the infusion is started, it's started out, we open up the normal saline and we'll just have saline going in. And then once we're ready to go, we clamp off the saline, unclamp the blood, and the blood will start to run into the patient. Remember, only Y-tubing, only normal saline, 
always on a pump. And remember this too, critical, critical, ATI and, and the boards. You must stay right next to that patient minimally for the first 15 minutes of that transfusion. Ideally, a half an hour is better, but minimally 15 minutes. Because if a reaction is going to happen, it typically is going to happen in the first 15 minutes. That doesn't mean that it can't happen later because it can, but most reactions will happen in that first 15 minutes. Okay? And that's everything you need to know that's in that chapter. We're going to get into more detail about different types of anemias and lymphatic diseases like lymphedema in the next chapter. So, ta-ta for now. See ya.